I am Trevor Vaughn. I'm one of the VP, uh, VPs and founders of Onyx Point Incorporated. Um, I have random letters after my name that mean things to some people. All right, so uh, Onyx Point does a lot of work in automation, security, and compliance. We've been doing consulting and contracting since 2009. We are Puppet Gold Partners, so if you need help with Puppet, let us know. Uh, we also GitLab Partners for doing a lot with uh, continuous integration, using Git, which apparently a lot of people need help with and um, work with Rails, CentOS, SUSE, different Linux platforms, all these good things. We are also the maintainers of SEMP, the SEMP platform, and um, that is a open source platform for automation and compliance of right now CentOS and Linux systems, uh, CentOS and Red Hat systems, but we will be moving into other, other arenas, including Windows in the very near future. So according to Google, this is our headquarters. It is amazing, it is that awesome, it really is. Um, this turns out to actually be a picture from Gears of War, and somehow it's, it's called Onyx Point, and somehow it got the top ranking. So whenever you look on Google Maps, this is us, and I'm super thrilled about that. So thank you to Google. Uh, we are that amazing. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is policy translation. So you probably thought this was going to be a talk about something exciting, and what I really did was I tricked you into a talk about systems engineering. So that's super good. Um, when you start to translate policy, you know, a lot of people are like, why, why do we have to do this? What does compliance have to do with real security? You know, it's, just, it's that constant argument. And th this is what I always point back to. Security is always disprovable and never provable, whereas compliance is both provable and disprovable. So we will we'll target compliance and hope for security. You know, do the extra, try to get to, to a secure system, but we have to comply with something so that we're moving in the right direction. And this lovely chart is what happened when I tried to figure out exactly what we were supposed to comply with. Uh, we work a lot with DoD systems and, and government systems, and so I started by mapping, okay, so we have the US government, it needs to follow the NIST regulations, we've got TLS, we've got key management, lots of people follow those, those are pretty good. Well, okay, what else do we have? Well, we've got uh, NIST 853 way down there, which spawns off into FIPS 148 2, HSPD 12, SCAP. It's a whole bunch of alphabet soup and wonderful stuff. And, like, and, and it's actually backed by laws. So, FISMA, FISMA and uh, PPD 21 and EO 13556, there will be a quiz. Um, those all say you have to do these things. I'm like, all right, this is, this, is, this is okay, but what about the rest of industry? Like, why does industry care? So, I started mapping more of it. Turns out if you're a government contractor, way up here in the, in the top, you have to follow uh, NIST 800-171. NIST 800-171 is basically the same thing as 853, but for people who are government contractors and hold the safety of government type data. I'm like, all right, that, that makes sense, we can cover that. But what about the rest, like the real industry, the real people? Well, it turns out if you take money from the government and you have to follow government rules for any reason, you too have to follow all this garbage. And that's been a surprise to a lot of people. So once I saw this basically massive loop of regulations that came around, I said, you know, what, what can we actually do about this? How can we actually try to capture this in an open source way, in a way that the entire community can get together and, and contribute to? And how do we actually prove that we're compliant with all this stuff? Proving compliance is both easy and hard. It's easy because, you know, if you have a list of rules, you can follow them. But it's hard because every single auditor out there has their own opinion. So we kind of jumped forward and went, okay, so there's got to be some standard that we can follow. Uh, NIST, I think this is 800-131, uh, the diagrams from 800-131, um, shows the risk management framework process over on the right, and it has what ends up being a mapping to the standard systems engineering body of knowledge system realization diagram. So it looks like this lovely waterfall diagram, and we all love waterfall, right? No, but anyway. But that's what it is. Um, and so you have this cyclic process where somebody said, hey, systems engineering has good practices. How about we put those on security and compliance? So they did. And what we're going to do is we're going to step through these different segments and see how you can use Puppet and the surrounding tools in Puppet to meet these different components of, of the uh, risk management framework lifecycle. We're going to start this with, by, with selecting our security controls and implementing those security controls. Selecting security controls is usually done for you. If you have a FISMA system, it's FISMA high, medium, low, somebody's gone through and selected some big blob of requirements that you have to follow, and it's up to you to do step three, which is implementation. 
Step one we're going to ignore, which is categorization of information systems, because you guys, everybody pretty much knows what their information systems are supposed to do. So I'm going to pop out in this 800171, which is the, again, the uh, contractor-ish or commercial entity side that deals with government. Um, and in there, we'll see that our requirement is to create, protect, and retain information system audit records with a bunch of other text, which is really fascinating. The actual requirement, so we now have a high-level requirement. So what's, the, what's, what's something we can do? So the, so the requirement is enable the audit D service. That's something, as an administrator of a system, I can do. But the specification is install audit D, enable audit D, and ensure that audit D is started at boot time. All three of these things have to happen to meet that one requirement at a basic level. And if you'll, if you'll notice, those are, those are things that Puppet's really good at doing. So we end up with something like this. We end up with a class that basically says, hey, all right, we're going to have two Booleans. At, we have enable equal to false. I've underlined that because that really isn't what you want to do. But for the purposes of this uh, demo, what we're going to go with by default. So enable is false. At boot is true because you all obviously want this thing to start at boot to have good auditing. We have a package which actually makes sure things are installed, which covers point number one, install audit D. We have a service, audit D enable, which gets set to the enable parameter and random clicking things. Um, that's lovely. Sorry about that. And um, now we have a little bit of logic that says, all right, so cur the kernel parameter um, native type does not handle trues and falses very well. It handles ones and zeros. So we do a little, little bit of translation that says, for kernel enable, the variable, we're going to look at enable, and if it's true, set it to one. If it's uh, anything else, set it to zero. So that covers our three requirements. We're installing it, we're enabling it, and we're ensuring that it's started at boot time based on the parameters above. So if you want to do something else, you're absolutely allowed to, but these are the requirements that we have to meet, to be able to meet. And even though this is set to false by default, we are able to meet those requirements with this class. So now we get down to, okay, we have the ability to do it, it's getting applied to systems, but our class was wrong. Our class wasn't actually turning this thing on. So we need to start assessing our security controls. Uh, the SIM project uh, that I lead created something that uh, we're calling the compliance module. And the point of this module is to give you a way to both map your parameters into different uh, specifications and also have those parameters consistently applied across your entire Puppet uh, code body at the same time. This is an example of what we have right now. This is version one of the specification. We are working on a, a new version that's going to be more flexible. But for right now, uh, we have the uh, compliance map under the compliance markup class. The module is called compliance markup. It will probably change in the future because that's a bit of a horrible name. But uh, so we have compliance markup, compliance map. The ver we, we versioned our, um, our format so that we know that if we have breaking changes, we can preserve backwards compatibility, things like that. Uh, the specification we have here is NIST 800171. This is actually the name of the YAML file that contains this data. That way we can easily differentiate between the different uh, body mappings, their policy body mappings. Um, audit D demo, if you remember, is actually the name of, that was the wrong class. It's actually the name of the class. So the class would be audit D underscore demo. And the parameter is enable. The identifiers is an array that actually shows the exact section of the policy that it maps to. If you'll remember, we're trying to meet policy section 3.3.1. So we want to be able to give our assessors and our auditors and ourselves the, the realization that we, we know precisely by setting this parameter that we're meeting this section. So here we have the identifier section 3.3.1 of NIST 800171. And the value on the system as it gets fed into Puppet, so the value of that class parameter should be true. Likewise, we have audit demo at boot, the second parameter, same section that it's trying to meet, and the value should also be true. Uh, currently in the SIMP framework, we have around 750 parameters mapped, and that's growing all the time as we expand. Uh, this includes both our own modules and modules that we include into our framework. So when you run Puppet, what it does is it uses a function that, we, that we've created to uh, drop down a very interestingly named, in a very inter interestingly named path, uh, this, this sort of output file. 
if you'll notice, this is actually opt puppet lab server data, puppet server sent compliance reports, which is a mouthful. But the reason we had to do that is because we needed something that this, the puppet server could write to by default. Be, and that's, this is the standard var, lo, uh, var der location of the puppet server itself. So again, here we're outputting their output data is version 1.0.1. We have our fully qualified domain name, our puppet server info, so that you know what puppet server was actually managing this system, so which one may or may not be out of compliance. And we have a uh, subhash of compliance profiles. You can map to multiple compliance profiles. In this case, we're doing one. And again, it shows you NIST 8171, a subhash of non-compliant entries, the class audit D, each parameter, each section that is inv invalid, the compliant value, which should be true, and the system value, which is false. So that false value is the value, if you remember, that we set in our class by default. That means that our class, by default, is non-compliant with NIST 8171. This is all output in JSON for every host, so it can be pulled into really any reporting system and processed without issue. Now, we also have the ability to expand on this and give you a list of parameters that you did not specify. So if for some reason something needed to be specified or you're mapping to it and you didn't, that means maybe your class is out of date or you changed something incorrectly. And we have the ability to put out a full compliant report to tell you everything that's actually compliant according to our data. I will warn you though that is a very, very large report. But we have had a lot of security officers come to us and say, hey, I need to know everything that's actually compliant. So we can give them the entire data set. And it kind of overwhelms them, but it's, but it's correct, so it's good. So all right, now we have the ability, so we've gotten to the place where we can do reports on our Puppet data itself. We can tell you that we know that we wrote Puppet code that is actually correct according to the specification. And as long as the security officers and auditors are okay with that mapping, you know, you're, you're golden. So you know that your code is supposed to do the right thing. But there's the other side of the coin. How do we actually know it's doing the right thing on the system? So this comes down to kind of mixing the assessment and authorization steps of the risk management framework. So we're going from, okay, I'm now, I've now assessed your system internally. We know we're doing the right thing. But we need to have something check the box saying, you know what, it is doing the right thing. Let this thing go to production. So this is the slide that gets me banned forever. Um, but we picked up a tool called Inspec by Chef. And um, MITRE was working closely with Chef to create something that was going to be a more usable answer to the SCAP framework. Uh, SCAP is fine, it's good. The SCAP security guide is a very good project, a good open source project to get started. But we found it very, very difficult to really tailor it to our needs. Um, you know, the SCAP security guide would say do one thing, and I said, you know what, I want to do 90% of what you're doing. But in our instance, the STIG says the uh, secure, security tec the secure technical implementation guide from DISA for Red Hat says that you should have these audit rules. And they sh but, but you should optimize them. Unfortunately, the SCAP security guy doesn't check for the optimized rules. They check for the unoptimized rules. And I'm like, hey, I, I follow the actual guide. I optimize my rules. So how can I overwrite these things in a way that makes sense and doesn't make me go through XML hell? So inspec is a Ruby DSL that's written around, that was originally written around server spec that gives me the ability to actually do overrides, map overrides, and actually know exactly what's going on down my stack. It's much, much easier, easier to deal with. So the SEM project picked up and started hosting what I'm hoping is going to be the new official repository for uh, inspect rules for the DISA-STIG and other standards over time. In the inspect language, uh, you'll have something that looks like this. In this case, we have control V72079. Who knows what that stands for? I don't either. Um, but in this case, it's actually enabled the audit daemon. The description is that the audit daemon must be running to collect audit logs. <clears throat> There's an impact number. The impact number actually allows you to start doing real calculations uh, based on the risk management framework's defense and depth approach. So in theory, as things stack up, or as, as protections stack up, so if you have IP tables turned on, maybe the 0 0.7 goes from 0 0.7 to 0 0.5 or 0 0.3. The idea is we can start doing actual calculations based on the risk of our system in depth. And again, we have our tag of NIST 8171, section 3.3.1, et cetera, et cetera. And we have a tag that is subsystems of audit and audit D. And the language, again, based on server spec, is described, service audit D should be running. It's pretty simple, pretty simple to get a hold of. Actually, a quick question. How many of you in here already use Beaker or something like it to do your system tests? All right, a few of you. Excellent. 
So again, the key is be running. You could also test for it shouldn't be running or anything else. But this is a separate language which gives us the ability to run these same tests inside, inside Beaker, outside Beaker, on a, on a given system. And it actually supports SSH mode as well. But I have uh, certain qualms about running arbitrary SSH commands in production. So we, uh, we try to do it local only. So what we did was we went in and said, you know what, we love Beaker. Um, we added something called Sweets to Beaker uh, with, the, with the goal that we can actually run these types of compliance tests. And the idea is your default test will check to see if your system works at all. And then the compliance suite will go in and check, does your system comply? But it, comes, it goes completely blank again. So it goes from a ground up approach. And here we have our default spec, which is basically get the system set up, make sure it's ready to test. We have uh, inspect failing tests who are actually going to make things fail. We're going to check that it fails properly. Uh, we have the enforcement. So we actually enforce things according to our NIST 171 profiles. And then we have the inspect passing spec, which checks that now that we've applied our profile, the system should pass. And the idea here is that we should be able to take any module off of the forge and map it into correctness. So where we had the, uh, where I showed you that mapping previously, we, over the past year, we've worked on taking that mapping, and instead of just reporting on it, we, are, we can now enforce it as well. So uh, initially, again, we're going to go from the default system configuration, and we're going to go down to the compliance failure. And hopefully, this is visible. You can see here, we're setting up our systems. This is all using Beaker. Um, we have our AutoD demo class. We're setting everything up. We're setting up an EL7 box. We're starting to run inspect. So it runs, it runs Puppet, it runs inspect. This may be slightly accelerated. Um, and you can see that we've skipped some rules. We've, uh, we have our statistics, which would be passed one. Good. That's the one that says that we should be on a boot. We failed none, and we skipped one. OK, that seems kind of weird. So that was our profile. You go down to the one that we inherited, which is the disastig, and it says, oh, here we go. We failed enabling the audit daemon, which is correct according to our class. So we now have a status of failure. The, uh, we passed one test, which again is the app boot test. We failed one test, which is the um, should be running test. And then we skipped one test. So we have a 50% score, which is not all that great. But this was what we expected. We expected that default class that we showed you earlier to fail, the acceptance test. If you ran this by hand, you would end up with something that looked like, uh, looked like this output. You'd have two checks under the audit D demo uh, specification. Um, so audit D demo checks for EL7, version 001, target is localhost, at boot, everything's awesome. But that's, a commit, that's actually a test that we wrote in our profile. We inherited from the disastig EL7 profile. And that profile, their check that we're inheriting failed, which is the audit D should be, should be running. So we have one success, one failure. And again, this is very readable. This is something that can easily be given to your ISOs, to your security officers. And um, they also have a JSON output where you can, so you can actually take this out for post-processing. And this is the best thing ever. I had to do almost no work to inherit from another profile. In the SGAP days, I would have had to create XML stuff and roll a whole new XML guide and want, want to just like, you know, flip tables. Um, but I can actually go through now and do inheritance based on single given controls. And it shows me that I did that. So there's, no, there's nothing hidden. I'm not pulling the wool over somebody's eyes. I'm not saying, hey, you know, yeah, I, I did all this myself and it's super awesome. Don't trust these people. I'm showing you exactly what I'm inheriting, exactly what I'm not inheriting. And you can do multiple inheritance. So you can actually inherit controls from multiple specifications, which lets you say, you know, I want some from the STIG, and some from 171, and some from CIS, and some from just random people across the internet, because you're all awesome. Um, and I'm sure you would audit my systems correctly. It's all right. Uh, so now we've got, gotten through this test. Everything looks good. So now we're ready to enforce things. So how, how do we actually do the enforcement? I showed you that the data structure previously, right here on, on the top, where we're doing this 8171. We enable, uh, we actually enable the audit, um, the audit service at boot time, and we enable the service. And so down down below, there's actually a uh, enforcement selection piece of higher data you have to set. So it's the enforcement parameter of the compliance markup class. And here, we've said we want that to be NIST 800-171. So 
So now I'm going to walk through the test where everything passes. So we went through the failing test. So now what we're doing is we're actually applying exactly this. This is the exact code that I copy and pasted from my demo. And we're going to run Beaker again with the, suite, with the passing suite. So you can see here at the top, I'm running rate Beaker suites and then the passing suite. So again, setting up the boxes, working on enforcing the policy. So here you can see that I'm rebooting the system to make sure it fully applies. I'm running inspect against the appropriate fixtures inside of the demo. And now I have two passing tests, no fail tests, and one skip test. And that skip test is interesting. It's a little, it's a little confusing, but the skip test is something that I inherited but overrode. So I didn't actually use it. But again, that lets the, that lets the auditor know, that lets the, uh, the security officers know that you know, you're not trying to pull the wool over their eyes and they can see exactly what you skipped. So there, now we've actually take, gone from Hira, again, no changes to my code base. I've gone from Hira and I've told it to comply with the NIST 800-171 standard. And again, the human readable output, if you ran this by hand, would look like this. You would say that uh, at boot, auditing should be enabled, nice and human readable. And again, the inherited profile, which is the disastig from EL7, it is now enabling the audit daemon, and the audit daemon is, is running. So we know from our automated testing that everything is working as designed. So as I said, we also partnered with GitLab. So one of the things we did is we took the open source version, this is the community edition GitLab with the GitLab CI runners. We put together a GitLab.yaml, uh, GitLabCI.yaml, and we set it up so that we have a full deployment pipeline right here with, for this module. On the left-hand side, we have our syntax checking, so we want to make sure it works in Puppet 4.7, Puppet 5, and using just the standard Puppet syntax checks that come with uh, whichever version is default. We have unit testing, so we go through and make sure using our spec puppet that all of our different tests pass, including tests with the different versions of Ruby and different versions of Puppet. So we're now doing a matrix test to make sure that no matter which version you're trying to deploy, it all works. The third column is the interesting column, and that's where we're at. we've actually run those same beaker tests that you saw, and we have a compliance test. So it's not just saying that my system works, my system works on real representative virtual machines or Docker containers, and my system applied and passed the compliance profiles. So that, to me, that's a big deal. To me, that's, you know, that, that, that's what I've always wanted. And using GitLab Enterprise, you could actually go in here and add a button. And there could be a button where your security officer could come in, see that that third column was green, and say, check, deploy. And that fourth column lights up for deployment, and you've now gone through including, accept, including compliance acceptance tests and deployed to production. So when I started reading different standards, and, and the first one I hit was actually the PCI DSS. Now, the PCI DSS was, was kind of interesting and in that one of the sections, it has its rules, and then one section said, oh, in addition to all our rules, you need to follow everybody else's rules too. And I was like, what? And it basically said, OK, what you have to do is you have to go out and find some other standard, NIST, CIS, something. Find a standard, make a standard, but you know, pick one that hopefully that's accepted by more than one person and follow it. So I'm like, well, that means what I have to do is I have to take the PCI policies, and then I have to actually put the, uh, something else under it. So PCI should win and say, I chose this 171 because maybe I'm a PCI DSS shop that also has to do government things. Um, so I put that under it. I need to be able to stack that. Luckily, Hira is very, very good at stacking. So what we did was we set it up so that you can see here in the, in the uh, top left that we have internal policy number five, whatever that is. PCI, something else, something your ISO is made up. Just, you know, you, ha you have to do these things. We do those, but then we take the entirety of the 171 mappings and put them under it. So your internal policies can override everything that you've, everything that you've brought from the outside world. In the compliance map on, on the bottom uh, left, you can see that, again, this is called internal policy number five. And we're saying that internal policy number five, section 1337.1, says that the value of turning on audit at boot should be false. Now, I'd hope that who, whichever security officer wrote this gets smacked, but um, 
But for some reason, you're turning off the audit daemon, and it's an internal policy, and that's great. And again, on the other side, you see the standard same this 800171 set of code. We didn't have to change a thing. All we did was, again, using Hira, we added the internal policy number five to override that audit demo at boot parameter. So we've gone through, basically that's, that's the bulk of the exciting part. That's how you, and again, this is all open source. This is all um, material that you can use for your own policies. You can make things up from scratch. If you use our module, we actually bring along uh, right now, two open source profiles for the DISA STIGs and for the NIST 800171. We will be expanding that over time. And if anybody wants to come through and help us map things, that would be super awesome. It's really tedious. But if you're having trouble sleeping, it's the way to go. Um, so now we've got something where we can get reporting. We can have reporting before we compile, or right after we compile, but before we deploy. So we can literally have reporting on do we mean to be compliant? Not are we compliant? Do we mean to actually be compliant, or was it an accident? You know, I don't like accidental compliance. I like compliance on purpose. And we can also check before we deploy to see if what we're going to deploy is going to meet the requirements. And since it's written in a language that can be run on remote systems, we can use that, those exact same checks, push them out using something like mCollective, run them, and pull the data back. So we've got all this data. What do we do with it? Step six of the risk management framework says that you should be monitoring your security controls. Monitor everything, watch everything, read through tomes of things. There are several vendors on the floor that would love to uh, get your business. There's one. Um, so in our case, we're taking JSON and log files, arbitrary log files from Puppet and from um, the inspect processor and from GitLab, uh, GitLab. You can push those through one of any number of systems, mCollective, uh, Logstash, Apache NiFi, and then send them back into something else. Uh, Elasticsearch, Splunk, Prometheus. You know, just do, do analysis on your, on your data. From a sim point of view, we brought in, um, we, we are bringing in both JSON and log files. I had no idea that was the JSON icon. It's really weird. But bringing in JSON and log files, we push them through Logstash, and we push them over to Elasticsearch. The reason that Sump did this was because we wanted to provide at least one open source solution to really all basic compliance problems. And this was kind of the de facto standard. We then went and said, OK, so how do we actually look at this stuff? And internally, to, to Onyx point, we started to go, like, what do we do? Uh, so we picked, uh, picked up Grafana. And we use Grafana instead of Kibana um, mainly because it does native um, access controls and it ties into LDAP uh, natively. So, um, so we picked that up and we started making dashboards that really tell us where things are compliant. On the top left, we have our number of SCAP checks, we have our average score, we have our severity, and then we have a bunch of different dials and, and bells and whistles, including actually telling us which checks are, are failing. So that's something that we've been developing internally, but this is just showing you that using all open source tools or using your own components, you can create dashboards off of this data because the data is well structured and is well known. We didn't just make up random stuff and throw it out there. We tried to give it something you can process automatically. So to recap really quickly, because apparently I went really fast. Um, but to recap, basically, we're going from uh, policies and procedures. We're implementing those security controls, in our case, using Puppet and testing with Beaker. Uh, we're pushing them through the SIMP compliance module to enforce these both at compile time and at runtime. We're passing that off into Beaker again using inspec from Chef. And we are then monitoring that with whatever you want. You know, if you want to send it, if you want to do chat ops, you can do that. If you want to use these ancient, weird devices like pagers, that's also viable. And uh, you can also put things to gra uh, Grafana, PagerDuty, et cetera. Just the, the point is that like, the, the tools are there. And we're hoping that you can take these, these components and really make them part of your infrastructure. Again, this is a Puppet module. These are Puppet modules and Puppet data. There's nothing closed about it. It's all open source technology. And it, it, will, it should enable you to both enforce your internal policies rigorously and bring in policies that we create or other people create and share online. So this is my man page, because I like dad jokes. Um, and you can find me at any of these given locations. And I'm hoping that uh, people have questions and want to learn more. I do have the demo code sitting here. I can dig into any, any aspect of it that you like.
Yes. Yes. Ah, <laughs> they're really nice guys. Um, so the NSA, the question was, where, are the, where does the NSA come into all this? And the NSA was where the SIMP project started. It was released about three years ago under a cooperative research agreement with, with Onyx Point. And um, basically the idea was that this was, this was stuff that everybody was trying to do. And people kept trying to reinvent the wheel. And the government, you know, feeling that people had you know, taxpayers had paid money in, into this, they should get back this material. So really where they come into it is there's a CRADA, uh, Cooperative Research and, and Development Agreement with Onyx Point, and we are working hard to make sure this meets the goals of the government as well as industry from a open source point of view. Yes? Um, yeah, we have actually. Um, so in terms of the SIMP modules, so SIMP is a framework. We kind of had a view of the world, right? Um, our recommendation generally is to set up a SIMP box, try it out, and then kind of see where it goes for you. Um, most people like the way we've done things, but if you don't, you can absolutely take the bits and pull them out and use them how you want to. It's, it's just Puppet. Like that's, that's the beauty of it. We didn't go crazy. We didn't start reinventing things. We just used open source technologies that were out there to try to meet standards. Um, so it, like I say, it really depends on how down the, down the weeds you've gotten. For your, our hope is that you'll be able to lay down um, SIMP as a, as a base framework and then put your applications on top of it. And, uh, and that's kind of like, you know, let us worry about the tedious stuff that we love, and you can worry about the tedious things that you love. But in terms of your mappings, if you have those mappings, you can just pick up the compliance module, put your own mappings into it, and enforce them. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, that's really why we wanted to get it out there. All right, uh, I actually do have another question. Um, oh, yeah. Sorry, uh, the lights are bright. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so uh, ha have you encountered many people who just try and uh, take SIMP and apply it to a gigantic already there environment? Yeah. Like, uh, how well does that usually go? Um, it, goes, it goes very well, actually. Um, it really depends on your use case. So. There, there are a few requirements around, so we, we, we release in different formats. Uh, we, we release as an ISO, we release as a set of RPMs. Right now we support Red Hat and CentOS, uh, and again, we are looking at other platform, platforms in the future. Feedback, welcome. Um, and we also are on the Forge, so you can download our modules from the Puppet Forge. Um, in terms of uh, pushing things out into a large environment, it does work well um, because it's just Puppet. So if you've already had a large scale Puppet infrastructure, these are just more modules. Again, we're not setting up crazy new services. We're not doing anything, you know, anything where you have to go and change the way you work. You just use some new modules. And now there are some requirements for some standards where you have to, like the DISA STIGs require a certain disk format, formatting. And that's actually why we, we release an ISO. Um, we release an ISO so that we can actually guarantee that you have the right disk format. But if you don't have to meet those, then it doesn't matter. And uh, actually, some, some more slightly more interesting um, things that we pulled out in the, near, in the recent past, we also have integrated TPM support, so the Trusted Platform Module. So we can actually take ownership of the TPM, and we're working on making it so that you can do a uh, basically full trust stack from the hardware level up and be able to uh, really go from TPM, at a, TPM to system integrity to Trusted Network Connect to full opportunistic IPsec across your entire environment. And when that works, I will be super happy and be back here talking about it. <laughs> but right now, we also have IPsec support. Um, but Red Hat 7.4 just added support for opportunistic IPsec, which makes IPsec work like TLS. Um, so that if I have a cert and you have a cert, we can now talk IPsec and just get on with life. And yes, containers do run on it. It's fine. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? Um, if you guys want, want me to walk through any parts of the beaker, um, the actual beaker guts that we're using, I can show you that. Um, but otherwise, then uh, we'll hang around. Um, Lucas Yamanishi is over there in a salmon-colored shirt. If you want more information, you can have him scan your badge, and we'll be happy to, happy to get in touch. Are you guys working on the Splunk app at all? Uh, so again, right now, we have not partnered with Splunk. And um, 
uh, we're concentrating on the, the open source stack. We are certainly happy to work with Splunk, but uh, no one's come along and, and told us to do so with funding to make it happen. Yes? Can you just clarify uh, real quick, uh, as far as baselines, like, so this is sticks and cover, sorry. I was just wondering if you could clarify, like, I think kind of in terms of baselines, so I know you mentioned this is stig is mm -hmm. something you guys are in, and I think you mentioned another one, maybe PCI. Um, is it, so, uh, are there things on the road, is it all kind of federal government type mm -hmm. standards or like something like CIS maybe on the roadmap one day or something? So yeah, um, right now the open source ones are the federal government ones. Um, the government paid for it, got it out there initially. Um, so we're trying to keep to that line of if it's, if it's for the government, we want to keep it open source. Um, we have mapped to other standards. We've mapped to PCI DSS, Sarbanes-Oxley, um, HIPAA, and a couple others. Um, CIS is kind of a sticky one. We've been trying to figure out how to approach it. Um, and uh, I know, so the, the open SCAP, the SCAP security guide had to call it C2S because of legal ramifications from CIS. So we're trying to really figure out how to approach that. And if anybody from CS on the internet wants to uh, let us know what we can do because this is open source, that'd be great. Um, but yeah, we, we actually do want to map the CIS and move that forward. But like I say, the, the legal people get weird. So we're trying to figure that one out. Yeah. Well, great. If there are no other questions, I'll let you get to your well-deserved map. Thanks.